This channel has many videos explaining how your brain is not like a computer. Neural networks and large language models are useful tools, but to progress to the next level, they need to evolve into a graph which is more like the way your brain works. This video turns the tables to explore how part of your brain is like a computer. For me, this is a truly fascinating insight. From walking to singing to playing the piano, your brain is executing internal programs to perform even the simplest tasks, and these programs have a lot in common with simple CPU functions. Let's dive in. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. In addition to AI work, I've developed software for several neurological test instruments and neural simulators, and along the way, learned a lot about the capabilities and limitations of biological neurons and how your brain must work to do the things it does. I founded the Future AI Society to pursue these ideas, and we're in the process of writing all aspects of this process in the Open Source Brain Simulator 3, and I invite you to participate. In this video, I'll show you some of the programs you've already added to your brain, which use low-level CPU capabilities. This will make more sense if you know a little bit about how CPUs work in terms of executing low-level instructions. In the next video, I'll demonstrate a more difficult problem you've already programmed your brain to solve, which uses even more complex CPU capabilities, which truly astonished me when I realized what your brain was doing. To understand how your brain accomplishes tasks like walking or singing, we need just a little background on the brain's three major components. The neocortex is responsible for interpreting sensory input, thinking, decision-making, and planning. It contains about 16 billion neurons, which make up roughly 18% of the neurons in your brain. The brain stem handles autonomic functions like breathing and heartbeat, and it contains about a billion neurons, a mere 1%. The cerebellum is the powerhouse of coordination containing a staggering 70 billion neurons, or 80% of your brain's neurons, in only about 10% of its volume. Now here's the question. Why does coordination take so much brain power? Your brain's primary job is to control your body. Think about it. Every thought, no matter how deep or complex, only has value if you act on it. Speaking, writing, or physically doing something makes your thoughts tangible. Here's how your brain controls your body. Signals from your motor cortex and arc across the top of the neocortex control your muscles. These signals are sent through motor nerves to your muscles. The more signals your muscles receive, the harder they contract. But here's the catch. Your neocortex is too slow. Remember the first time you tried to do something new, whether it was writing your name or learning a musical instrument? It was painfully slow and uncoordinated. It takes years for a baby to learn to walk and talk. That's because your neocortex was doing the heavy lifting, controlling every tiny movement. This is where the cerebellum comes in. If the neocortex is the thinker, the cerebellum is the doer. Its job is speed and efficiency. You can think of the cerebellum as a set of tape recorders. Whenever you perform an action, the cerebellum pays attention and records motor signals coming from your neocortex. If you repeat an action enough times, the cerebellum saves the recording and strengthens it with each repetition. And as we all know, learning a new physical skill can take hundreds or thousands of repetitions. Here's the magic. The cerebellum can play back these recordings faster and more accurately than the neocortex. This is why with practice you can perform actions like walking, playing the piano, or dancing faster, smoother, and more consistently.
But what about flexibility? If your cerebellum only stored complete recordings, you'd lack the adaptability needed for everyday life. Instead, your cerebellum makes recordings of tiny fragments that build on each other so your brain can mix and match things that it has learned to do. That is, they can reference one another just like functions in a computer program can call one another. Let's take singing a nursery rhyme as an example. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. In your cerebellum, there is only one recording of the nerve firing sequence needed to say row, and it can be used multiple times. If that wasn't the case, your brain would quickly fill up with zillions of copies of all the words in all the possible phrases which use them. Storing only one copy represents data compression an important feature within the brain where you can't add more RAM if you run out. The rhyme translated into the International Phonetic Alphabet tells us the word row consists of three unique phonemes or configurations of the vocal tract. First is the R sound, then a transition from O to O sound. Your brain builds a hierarchy of recordings. At the lowest level, you have the motor signals for each phoneme, and these low-level recordings actually cause coordinated motor nerve firings. There are many dozens of muscles in the human vocal tract which must be coordinated to create a sound, so it takes years for infants to learn to say intelligible it's words. Enough. In the Brain Simulator 2, there is a module which is coded to create a phoneme sound whenever a related neuron fires. Above phonemes, you have recordings for individual words which call on these phoneme recordings. Row. At a still higher level, you have a recording for each phrase or line which calls Row. the word recordings in Row. sequence. And finally, Row. a level for Here. the entire song which fires Boat. the four lines for each phrase. This is a lot like developing a computer program where various functions call others. You could envision this as a Python program where methods say or sing individual phonemes, words, phrases, or songs. Unfortunately, this code can't work because Python's text-to-speech engine wants full phrases and won't work with individual phonemes, but you get the idea. Here's how this entire process might look in neurons as simulated in the Brain Simulator 2. Row, row, here, vote, row, 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 here, vote. There is a master sequence that calls the four individual lines, each of which calls individual words, which go to the special neurons to generate the phonemes. Row, 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 your boat, gently, down, that, stream, merrily, 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 live, is, but, a, dream. There's a lot to be learned from such a simulation, particularly facets which don't work as well as you think they should. I'll expand on these if there's interest. But you may have noticed that the song and phrase sequences each have two rows of neurons. Why is that? It's to handle feedback. Your brain receives constant feedback from your body. That way, instead of just running all the steps of a recording in a rapid fire sequence, each step in the sequence can wait for the completion signal from your body. This coordinates your brain with your muscles and also allows you to stop an action before it is run to completion.
That way you can start singing a song and stop whenever your neocortex decides it's time to stop. This is directly analogous to programs which can call functions asynchronously or wait for completion. Now things get even more fascinating. Let's focus on the word merrily in the song. Merrily, 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 merrily. It repeats four times in the third line, but each merrily is sung at a different pitch. When the merrily function is called, it must include a parameter for the pitch. In computer programming terms, this is like passing an argument to a function. The same principle applies to speed or volume or any one of a number of vocal variations. This flexibility allows you to hum the tune without the words, sing the song faster or slower, or sing it in a different pitch. Further, many of these arguments are relative. That is, when you sing the entire song at a different pitch, the relative pitches of the individual words are maintained. If you have suggestions as to how this might work in your brain, I'd really like to hear your ideas. While we're at it, although we can be sure that the functions in your cerebellum accept parameters, where do the argument values come from and how are they passed? Let me know in the comments. Let's talk about timing. Coordinating muscle movements, especially for speech or other rapid complex action, requires extreme precision. If you want to speak a word, it's important that your tongue and lips arrive at the desired positions at the right times. This is complicated by the time it takes for neural signals to reach their destinations, traveling about a million times slower than electrical signals. Neurons are really slow relative to transistors, with the best simulated neuron sequencers firing about 8 milliseconds per step. Each step could be firing multiple nerve signals simultaneously to achieve the fluid motion required for activities like dancing or playing an instrument. But is this fast enough? Suppose you needed a neural signal only one millisecond after the previous. How can this be done? I had to solve this problem to build a CPU from telephone relays, and while you can't make neurons run faster, it's easy to make them run slower. Neural pulses in the brain run so slowly that a two millimeter long axon will introduce a one millisecond delay. By varying these axon length and delays, neurons can produce sequences of signals with any desired resolution. If the cerebellum uses this strategy, it is similar to the pipelining process in modern CPUs where the next instruction starts processing before the previous instruction has completed. But the brain doesn't just call functions with parameters. It also supports loops and conditional logic. For example, I can ask you to sing merrily three times instead of four, and you could do that without a problem. Merrily, merrily, merrily. How does your brain know when to stop? At a low level, CPUs and your brain must support some equivalent to a jump instruction to create the loop and an if statement in order to know when it should stop. Putting these together, we're building up quite a nice little instruction set for your brain. And we know that with not very many opcodes, we can build a perfectly useful CPU. Although most of us learn by repetition of physical activities, perhaps the savants among us have some unique ability to program their brains to do other things as well. I've proposed that your cerebellum can execute this instruction set, but it will become obvious that your neocortex can do this and more as well as I'll explore next time. So what does all this mean? Coordinating your muscles to do useful things is important, but difficult because neurons are so slow. Here, Robotics has a distinct advantage because control CPUs are so much faster than neurons. 
The cerebellum is a recorder which learns sequences of motor signals which can be played back faster than recorded. This forms a schema very similar to a computer program with functions calling one another with arguments, loops, and conditional logic. But unlike a computer, your brain is programmed by example, repetition, and feedback. This is why you can master complex skills from playing an instrument to ballet by breaking them down into smaller programmable components. We call this muscle memory, but it actually exists in your brain. The cerebellum handles the speed and precision, while the neocortex provides flexibility in decision making. In the next video, I'll describe a deceptively simple problem which is solved by an algorithm which you've programmed your brain to perform. It will show how your brain has even more programming features than I've introduced so far. This understanding of the brain's programmability has profound implications for artificial intelligence. Current AI systems like neural networks excel at pattern recognition but struggle with flexibility and adaptability. By studying how the brain organizes and processes information, we can design AI systems that are not only faster and more efficient, but also capable of reasoning and adapting in ways that resemble human thought. In other videos, I've promoted the idea that information in the thinking part of your brain must be organized in a graph structure of nodes and relationships. In this video, I've introduced another part of your brain which is a lot more like a computer. So the next time you sing or dance or just take a walk, remember that your brain isn't just singing. It's running beautifully complex programs. From syllables to sequences to entire songs, your cerebellum and neocortex work together to make it happen. If you found this fascinating, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comments. And stay tuned for our next video, where we'll explore how your brain's algorithms reveal even more about its programmability. And as always, thanks for watching.